Hi, I'm here today with Dr. Walter Parson from the Institute of Legal Medicine in Innsbruck, currently the ISFG president, and as well as setting up national DNA databases and currently managing research programs in the forensic molecular biology, he oversees high throughput DNA database lab in Innsbruck. His current research focuses on NGS techniques, particularly the use of mitochondrial in forensics. Welcome, Dr. Parson. Much of your current research focuses on NGS techniques, particularly the use of mitochondrial. You've done a lot of work in the area of the MPOP data bank um, that aims for the collection, quality control, and searchable presentation of mitochondrial haplotypes from all over the world's community. Can you tell me more about the use of mitochondrial DNA in forensics? Well, we, we like this marker, mitochondrial DNA, for samples that are very difficult to analyze. So for a crime scene, for example, you have like, you know, blood, saliva, hair samples. Some of them would work with the conventional STRs that we are using in forensics, some do not. Either we stop here with these samples or we try to get a result by mitochondrial DNA analysis. There's been some use of the mitochondrial control region uh, using capillary electrophoresis, uh, but not a lot of whole mitochondrial genome analysis. Um, now that NGS is becoming more accepted and available to the forensic community, do you see that being more widely adopted? The mitochondrial DNA control region is um, a limited information that we get from a, an unknown sample, but it, it was exactly what was doable with Sanger type sequencing. If we would like to go for an entire mitochondrial genome which has much more information, we cannot do it with Sanger because the technology doesn't allow for that. We now have a, an instrument and a chemistry uh, in, in our hands that allows us to sequence the entire mitochondrial genome and to get, it's actually the maximum information you can get from the mitochondrium. You've been involved in a number of different projects to identify ancient remains and disaster victims. Can, can you tell me about one of those? Well, one of the first uh, cases that we were involved was the tsunami victims. That was quite a challenging case, although the samples were pretty young in terms of when this happened. They were only a couple of weeks old. Mm -hmm. But the high temperature and the moisture uh, led to a very strong and severe degradation of the material. So this is why we were looking at heavily degraded DNA and it was quite challenging for our laboratory to, to analyze the samples. So we were reviewing our extraction procedures to get more DNA out of these remains. And we were reviewing our the way how we would amplify and sequence those uh, those um, samples. And eventually that led us into a position where we uh, are considered a laboratory that can deal with difficult samples, like problematic from the technical standpoint, but also problematic from the political standpoint. So we were dealing with the uh, Russian Tsar family, with the missing children. Uh, we are involved in the uh, identification of the victim of the Chile regime in 1973 and the very recent one is the uh, Mexican students, the missing Mexican students of uh, 2014 where apparently the, uh, the individuals were killed and burned and they were burned in such a, um, under such strong heat that the remains are almost not amenable to DNA typing. Thank you for your insights today, Walter. And to learn more, you can join us at thermofisher.com forward slash HID.